Good evening and uh, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Uh, I will be briefly introducing the format and the uh, structure of the college. Ron will be taking over once we get the preliminary introductions over with. Uh, the college format is very simple for those of you who are not new, but I'll let Brown take over since he's uh, ready to go. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, the college uh, meets uh, till 11 o'clock. We uh, first have uh, announcements. Proceed to the speaker, uh, uh, who is Leanne Caston tonight, and uh, she will be speaking on the subject, Why Genetically Engineered Food is Dangerous, and uh, she will go into a good deal of detail. Is this about the uh, yeah, yeah, I got six handouts left. Two more. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I have what is really a very uh, frustrating story to tell you. It's frustrating because it's been taking a long time for most of the people anywhere. Uh, to learn about what really is going on. Okay, do you want me to take this out? Okay. In a way, th oh, this is much better, thanks. In a way, this is a story about two different issues, but they're combined. The issue number one is about farming and genetically engineered crops. <coughs> issue number two is literally the takeover of our, our USDA, our U.S. Department of Agriculture, and our FDA. Um, this is a, a time when both of them have meshed together. First, let me tell you about Monsanto's history. Uh, Monsanto is becoming um, the absolute symbol of whatever one would call corporate greed. There really are no other words to use. Um, years ago, they were one of the major manufacturers of Agent Orange. Now, how many of you know what Agent Orange is? Please, if you don't know, I'll tell you. If you don't know, quick. Okay. Agent Orange, and put this down because you're going to need to remember it. Agent Orange is comprised of two different formula. Formula one is 245T. 245T. That has been banned for a long time. People are no longer allowed to use it in America. 24D has not been banned and has been used periodically for a whole bunch of different reasons, which we will get into. But both of those, both of those different chemical formulas contain the most toxic chemical known to man, dioxin. There's no equivocation about it, there's no question about it. Dioxin is the most toxic chemical known to man, and it can, in parts per trillion, begin to cause cancer. If you're exposed to it over a period of time, you will get absolutely unequivocally, you will get your cancer, or whoever you are, whatever particular organ in your body is not necessarily the strongest, that, that organ will begin to deteriorate and become ill because of the dioxin in it. So if you have a heart problem, it'll help hurt your heart. If you have a kidney problem, it'll hurt your kidneys. Whatever it is, but dioxin can do this, okay? Now, why am I mentioning the Vietnam War? Because Monsanto was the one company that in its manufacturing process created more levels of dioxin than any of the other seven chemical companies combined. So what the chemical companies were doing during the Vietnam War was to basically find a way to meet together out of their alarm that God forbid the U.S. 
government should find out about Monsanto and its dioxin as if they give a damn now. And the U.S. government would put a stop to the spraying, and they didn't want that to happen. So Dow Chemical and all the other companies got together and started meeting about what do we do about Monsanto. Guess what? They didn't do a thing. Monsanto continued to manufacture its Agent Orange with the highest levels of dioxin, at which point in the war, all the Agent Orange barrels were kind of mushed together, so you got the Agent Orange from Dow, the Agent Orange from Thompson Company, the Agent Orange from Monsanto, you got all of it mixed together. And by the time you mixed it together, these military men were exposed to huge high levels of dioxin. That's number one. Pass, pass forward to aspartame. How many of you know what aspartame is? Some of you do. Do you know it's a neurotoxin? Do you know that it is one of the most toxic chemicals we can eat? And it's in everything that you see that's called diet. Diet this, diet that, God forbid. We should think we're on a diet and drink Diet Coke. What you're doing is drinking poison. And pregnant women are in deep, deep trouble if they start drinking this stuff. It can even harm the fetus. There's absolutely no doubt about this. By the way, when I say anything to you, I'm just a bloody good journalist. What I am not is making anything up. So you've got to believe that everything that I am saying to you has been well researched. And if I gave you all the, the data on the research, you would never get into what I need to talk to you about. So we'll just uh, assume that what I'm telling you is truly well researched. So we've got aspartame. Which, many years ago, yes, the FDA said, this is toxic stuff. We do not want this. This is dangerous stuff. And guess what? Who overruled them? Donald Rumsfeld. And Donald Rumsfeld was the man who said, we're putting this in. We're allowing it to be everywhere. And now aspartame, or NutraSweet, or whatever bloody name you want to call it, any diet, anything, now it is totally, totally suffused with aspartame. It becomes addictive, it's very hard to get rid of, and once we are eating this or drinking this stuff, we really think we're losing weight. Instead, it creates a craving for sweet and we gain weight. What? Yeah. No, syrup. Now let's go to bovine growth hormones. Do you know about the bovine growth hormones? Yeah. I see a few of you smart people who do. Bovine? Yes. Bovine growth hormones is a chemical that has been put into, injected into the cow. And the theory behind it is that we are supposed to see increased um, milk from the cow. It's going to enhance the production of milk in the cow. That's the reason. And you'll get a lot more <coughs> bang for your buck, Farmer Jones, if you uh, inject your cows with bovine growth hormones. Well, there's a problem or two. That's also a Monsanto product. That also is, one, something that creates mastitis in the cow. Mastitis is an infection, the cow keeps milking, they keep pulling on the udders, the udders get infected because the irritation is so great. So we're eating, or drinking, and, or eating because you get a lot of milk products like this too, what we're eating is pus. And then what we're eating on the side of the pus is antibiotics. So they add antibiotics and pus to the milk because of the mastitis. What also happens is it really destroys the cows uh, five years earlier than they should because the cows are worn out. They're milked and milked and milked and milked to death and they literally wear out. So the cow does not have the longevity that a normal cow does. And there's something else. The hormone creates something called insulin growth factor, IGF. 
which is a preliminary to breast cancer. I put that in my book many years ago, in my first book. And it is preliminary to breast cancer. There is absolute direct correlation between insulin growth factor and the hormone and breast cancer. There's absolute proof. It came out in not one, but three medical journals of great value and great fruit. And it disappeared. It totally disappeared. And again, I'm going to bring in my media background. Why did it disappear? Because no one wanted us to know that we are now beginning to eat and drink food that is no longer healthy. Now that's what Monsanto has been doing in the meantime. One other thing that I must tell you about that Monsanto does is pollute. Has anyone heard of Anniston, Alabama? One man. Anniston, Alabama is a toxic dump site of Monsanto's waste. And guess what Mons Alliston, Anniston, Alabama is? It's mostly a black community. They knew what they were doing, they did it on purpose, and finally, finally, someone was able to stop them. But you're talking about a mountain of people who became extraordinarily sick from all the toxins that were in Monsanto's waste. They just dump. They do it any time of the day or night. Okay, shall we get to GMOs? What are GMOs? Genetically Modified Organisms. GMOs, now this is my vision because I'm no scientist and I have absolutely no idea how they really do it in a mass production way. But what I visualize in my mind is they take a little needle and they take a foreign substance and literally take the seed of corn or soy or cotton or even now zucchini and beets, and they take this little needle and they stick the very DNA in the seed with this foreign stuff. A lot of the stuff is either bacteria or viruses or something that would never normally grow in a normal plant. It's totally foreign. I'm sorry. Completely foreign. I don't know how they do it in terms of mass production, but all these seeds have been chemically <coughs> modified. And with this chemical mod, each one of these chemical modifications has a different formula, depending on whether you're growing cotton or beets or soy or corn. But if you're growing any of these things and you are seduced into buying these chemically modified seeds, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. Now, let's talk about the trouble. There's trouble to humans, and there's trouble to the environment. Huge trouble to both. One, you, once you start using these seeds, you can't really plant organic anything anymore. So what you're stuck with for the rest of your farming life is the monoculture. And the monoculture means you have to plant the same thing over and over again, which does not allow for variety in the soil, which does not allow for the soil to replenish itself, which does not allow the soil to nurture itself. So what you're doing is making more and more chemicals into the soil, and eventually, guess what happens? You plant two or three or possibly four plantings and the super weeds and the super bugs start getting at you and you've got super weeds and super bugs that are making it impossible for the original promise to work. You're not going to have the original promise. Monsanto promises you'll never have any more weeds once you take our this. And four seasons later, you're going to have super weeds they don't know how to get rid of. They just don't know how to rid themselves. Until, now we're going to get back to 2,4-D. Until people are so desperate that they'll use 2,4-D. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
That's number one. Number two, let's talk about it, what it's doing to humans. There are more and more studies coming out identifying the danger that genetically modified food is causing humans. You first start with animals. You always have animals first to make your you know, original analysis. But, and it's, and it's not happening. It is not happening in America. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You have to find these studies outside of the United States. The studies are in France, the studies are in Germany, some of the studies might be in England, but not many. Not many, I can promise you, because England and the United States are really in cahoots together. But you will find some studies outside the U.S. and they're discovering horrible effects. The rats are developing grotesque tumors, horrible tumors. And after the third pup, the third generation of pups, they die. They just die. There have been studies where there have been G, uh, genetically modified corn over here, genetically, non-genetically modified corn over here. All the animals go immediately to the non-GM corn. They eat that. They walk away from the genetically modified. Somehow in their gut, they know they have to stay away from this stuff. They know it. Now I will tell you the story of two scientists. The first scientist was Arpad Putzai, P-U-T-S-Z-A-I. Don't quote me on the spelling because I don't do spelling. Arpad Putzai was a Hungarian who worked at the Rowett, R-O-W-E-T-T -T, Institute in Scotland. He started, and he was a very well, well respected and very um, conscientious scientist. And he started experimenting with potatoes that were genetically modified and rats. And he discovered that the rats were dying. The babies of the rats were dying. He discovered some serious stuff here. And he went out into the world to publicize this because he was getting very, very alarmed. And guess what happened? No, close. He was fired. Monsanto came down like 10 ton bricks, put pressure on the UK and on Scotland, and the man was fired. I'd say it was about 10 years ago, but it started a path that hasn't quit. That's a good question. Because it was the beginning of the warning to scientists, whatever you find out, either keep your mouth shut or don't do the studies. There's another study very similar to that. Only this one is on a, a, a professor named Chappelle, C-H-A-P-E-L-L, -L, I think. Don't quote me. Um, he went to Mexico and found, because all genetically modified plants, not the seeds, but the plants, have a tendency to spread. The pollen actually grows, and then the wind and the bees take over, and the wind and the bees make this pollen grow way far away, five, ten miles away, to someone's farm that could very well be organic. Guess what has happened? That organic farmer has just lost his work. He can't work anymore. His fields have been destroyed. Okay? So what we have, and Monsanto, by the way, is counting on that. So what Monsanto goes and does, what Monsanto goes and does, and has been very successful at this until this last year, what Monsanto goes is they have a police department that goes to the farm fields and they have a technique and the technique is to identify what fields have been contaminated with their GM seeds, at which point they turn around and immediately sue 
they have this farmer because he's using their patented seeds. The farmer who didn't buy it, didn't want it, and was using organic material in order to create his own market is now out of business or has to give up anywhere between twenty-five to $100,000 in fines to Monsanto. And the U.S. courts have been allowing this to happen because of their damn patent. And there was a sense of injustice here that was just astonishing. Just astonishing. Until this year. And this year a group of farmers came together and decided as a class action to sue Monsanto for ruining their market. And it just was recent. It's not very well known. It only came across the internet. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't have a clue as to what the decisions will be. But it looks to me as if finally someone found some courage. Finally. But it took a long time. And in, uh, I think I got off the subject because I was talking about what else was going on in, um, in the fields. I'll get back. In the meantime, does everyone know, does anyone know the tale of Percy Schmeiser? <coughs> Beverly. Canadian farmer. Canadian farmer who said, okay, I didn't buy this stuff. I didn't want this stuff. I have taken an entire 40 years to make the best canola seeds that any farmer anywhere in Saskatchewan could possibly create. And their bloody old seeds contaminated my yard, my fields, my life, and now they're suing me. After all these years of culling and cleaning and making these seeds the best canola seeds any Canadian farmer has ever cultivated. And Percy Smyser was mad. He was furious. So what did Percy Smyser do? Monsanto went and sued him and he said, I'm not paying you a dime. And it went all the way up to the Canadian Supreme Court. But in the meantime, this took a long time it took years before it went through the, you know, first the first level, then the appellate level, and the da 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 da, whatever levels there were, and then finally it went to the Canadian Supreme Court. In the meantime, people all over the world were really screaming in praise of Percy Smyser, this wonderful man. He's probably in his 80s by now. He's a farmer. He has a darling wife who cooks like a, a, like a storm. They have five kids and 150,000 grandkids. I mean, he's a perfectly wonderful farmer who was dedicated to what he was doing. And Monsanto cut him off at the pass. So everybody across the entire globe, except in America, knew about this. So Percy took the entire case to the Supreme Court and in a stupid, unbelievably dumb judgment, the Supreme Court decided, yes, Monsanto's patent does hold sway against every other thing, but in the meantime, Monsanto, Monsanto has to pay for all the court expenses. So Percy came out scot-free. He didn't have to pay a dime, and Monsanto had to come through, and out of their multi, multi, multi-million dollar whatever, they had to pay for the entire court affair, which Percy felt was a kind of victory in his own way. I don't know how the Supreme Court made this kind of split decision, but it certainly did, and that was kind of a nice story, okay? Um, in the meantime, you've got Roundup Ready. Roundup Ready is the most used pesticide you can find anywhere in the United States. It's phenotoxic. It screws up your reproductive system. And the US media has not been willing to tell one bit of that. So it's coming out in internet stories. 
it's coming out all over, except that you except you go to Walmart or wherever you're going to go, and you're going to find Roundup Ready. They're selling it like mad, and people do not realize how toxic this is. All right, so what we have now is another story, an Indian story. I just saw a dreadfully sad movie. It's the story of Indian cotton farmers who are profoundly poor. They have to go from one planting to the next to borrow the, the uh, money for the next year's planting. There were a number of Monsanto offices that seduced with promises that were totally false, totally lies, <coughs> seduced these farmers into taking their GM cotton seeds. Guess what? The GM cotton seeds didn't come as produced. They weren't viable. Most of the farmers lost huge amounts. They couldn't pay back their loans. They had, and in India, which is something that we we don't do anymore. But in India, women are married if they have enough of a dowry. And the farmers who went into debt and could not pay back their loans had no dowry money for their daughters. These are small farming communities. There was no way these farmers could find enough money anywhere. Their fields had not produced the cotton. And as a result, there are probably a hundred suicides a month in India. The Indian farmer has now found suicide as his only solution for the shame of not being able to pay his debt and be able to pay any husband the dowry that the husband demands. And there was a movie on it last week in Evanston that was heartbreaking. All, all the young women were hoping to marry, and their daddies couldn't have the money to do it. And the farmers were so ashamed and so frustrated. And the interesting thing was that before the planting season, there were a whole bunch of regional farming offices where Monsanto had a major desk. So when they started failing in their crops, the farmers called the offices, and there was no one to answer the phone. The offices had closed down. Monsanto had disappeared. There was no one there. So these people were left with nothing. Now, you all know Vandana Shiva. I mean, she was one of the great agricultural uh, Indian women in the planet. She's marvelous. And she has some beautiful and wonderful things to say about it, which I will quote you as soon as I... I'm almost finished. Anyway, let's get back. Be there was one man, I mentioned him, uh, Professor Kapel. He was up for tenure at the University of California. And Professor Kapel had gone down to Mexico and had found where their Mexican farmers had developed infinite and wonderful ways to do farming, especially corn. They had beautiful, beautiful, beautiful corn diversity, gorgeous different kinds of corn for different kinds of needs. They were wonderful. And nothing in Mexico could have induced the kind of genetically engineered corn that suddenly started cropping up in Mexico, except through drift. And Professor Capel identified where the drift came from. It came from the other side of the border. The drift was so intense that that corn crop actually became toxic with GMOs. And he published it. And guess what? Monsanto demanded that he do does not get tenure. So not only does Monsanto demand that he does not get tenure, but his colleagues at the university in the Department of Agriculture rallied to him, made such a noise, such a stink, that the department dared not 
and on the senseless wishes. So Professor Capel got his tenure, but only after there was a huge uprising. But again, these are stories that have warned most of the ag departments most everywhere. From Iowa, certainly, with Tom Vilsack as head of USDA, and with uh, University of Illinois Department of Ag, I can promise you, all these departments are now endowed heavily by Monsanto. And there won't be anyone with the courage to do the kind of studies that are needed to do to be done in America. So most of the studies, as I've said, are going on outside of the United States. Because Monsanto has now a lock, an absolute lock, on the departments of agriculture and a lot of places. You're not seeing studies coming out any other way. Okay, internationally, France just said no to GM maize. Uh, Germany said no to a lot of GM seeds. There, are, it's growing. Can, Canadians said no to bovine growth hormone milk because they didn't like what was happening to the cows. They were furious. And Monsanto put up multi-million dollar campaigns to get Canada to buy their milk, but apparently in their campaigns they were found to have lied seriously. And other times, other times with their ad campaigns they're found to have lied, so they are fined a great deal with whatever ad campaign they have, okay? Okay, so what do we have as a solution? There is Proposition 37 in California, and we're now going to get serious about Proposition 37. Um, Proposition 37 is a statewide effort in November to get labels on all GM foods. And it is such a big threat to Monsanto that they alone have poured millions and millions of dollars into lying about how GM seeds are going to feed the world, you name it, the entire PR groups, to lie about what's going on with, with how wonderful these GM seeds are. God knows how well they make it up, I can't imagine. Very creative people are making these amazing lies about GM seeds. But there are several groups and if you have a piece of paper, please write these wonderful groups down. Group number one is Institute for Responsible Technology. Group number two is Organic Consumer Association. Both of them are on the internet. And both of them are soliciting huge amounts of help, money, make phone calls, do whatever you can. Um, I have the names of anybody who's interested in making phone calls, even from Chicago area. <coughs> Please call. They'll give you a list of people's names. Um, Organic Consumer Association. They are wonderful. Both these groups, Organic Consumer Association and Institute for Responsible Technology, I have nine of these if anyone wants to buy one. I have nine. They're going to give you a great deal of information, stuff that I don't have. But they'll give you a few, there are three, there are three videos at the same set, in the same time. If anyone wants, let me know. Also, the guy who started Institute for Responsible Technology is Jeffrey Smith. This is his first book. His first book is Seeds of Deception. You can probably find it on Amazon. Look and see. It's a very revealing book. It's got lots of valid information. Okay? Um, there's a third thing. Jeffrey Smith is coming out today, within the next few days, with a dynamite video it's going throughout California on every television station they can find. And the video apparently is brilliant. My daughter saw it and said, Mom, you've got to get a hold of this video. It's one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, a video that Jeffrey Smith just finished 
apparently it's not short, it's well over an hour, but you've got to see it. She said it's just brilliant. And that video is going to be all over everywhere. What's it called? This, well, if I can find it on my notes, I'll give it to you, but let me find it on my notes first. Um, and by the way, there is a list. Uh, Organic Consumer Association has made a list of all the corporations that are fighting with Monsanto in order to maintain their GMO product, including Kraft. I don't remember all the others, but I do know that Kraft is one of them for sure. And go to uh, Organic Consumer Association and check on uh, who else is up there with Monsanto doing what they can to really defraud the people. Okay? Defra oh, here it is. I think. Genetic roulette, the gamble of our lives. That's the name of the newest one. Genetic Roulette. It's a DVD. DVD. The, right. The Gamble of Our Lives. And that's the latest. And Jeffrey Smith's bringing that out. And it's going to probably blast as many TV stations in California as it can. Okay? Um, and in the meantime, all these corporations are throwing millions and millions into ads saying, no, we don't need or we don't need labels, we don't need anything. Well, think about this, guys. We know what vitamin C is in our food. We know what vitamin A is in our food. We know how much weight is in our food, how many calories are in our food, and we can't know whether our food is genetically engineered. Something's weird here. Now, one of the last things I'm going to tell you is that the USDA and our FDA have both been complicit in allowing for this. Our USDA has become an advocate for genetically modified seeds to the point where they have gone across the ocean into foreign countries, into Africa, into Asia, pushing genetically modified seeds like crazy. They understand that what Monsanto is trying to do is literally take over the entire development of seeds in the world. And Monsanto has said just that much. They understand that. And so our USDA has bought into it. The FDA has bought into bovine growth hormones and the FDA has bought into aspartame. There have been over 92 different identified illnesses with aspartame. They have been recorded by the FDA, and the FDA is impotent to do anything about it. They won't. So we're now talking about a collusion between government and corporations that at this point I think we should all be pretty scared about. Um, I will end this conversation with a quote with quote, if I can find it. Oh, one more book. This is, I think, going to be out within the next month. This is written by a man named Steve Drucker, D-R-U-K-E-R. -E Altered Genes <coughs> Twisted Truth. Truth. Altered Genes Twisted Truth. Please, I know Steve. He's a wonderful writer. He's a lawyer. This is a hot book. Please go out, get to Amazon, and buy it. Okay? Now, we are dealing with, we are dealing with the, the corruption of our food supply. If you want, we don't have time for me to talk about factory farms. We don't have time for me to talk about what's going on with our meat supply. We've got to be vigilant about it from now on because what we are eating is not necessarily healthy anymore. It started with pesticides many, many years ago. Now it's really gotten draconian. So I will close with this wonderful quote. Human beings cannot be against nature without being against ourselves. 
We are part of the natural world, just like every other life form on this planet. Our fantasy that we can use our technology and power to completely divorce ourselves from our material, physical reality is just that, a fantasy. We eat by the grace of nature, not by the grace of Monsanto. For the entire history of Homo sapiens, we have always eaten organic. It's only been in the last 50 odd years, post World War II, that wartime chemicals and technologies have found new uses in agriculture. The rest has been the rapid and wholesale devastation of vast, vast swaths of our planet, biodiversity giving way to monoculture, killing weeds, pesticide resistant superbugs, going wild. That's how concentration, uh, that's how high the concentration of wealth is. And when you have that type of wealth, you could uh, buy off any politician you want, you could buy off any, uh, in any uh, part of the government, and capital controls everything. And that's what you have today. Now, they had uh, problems in Cuba years ago where they couldn't get the seeds and they couldn't get different things because there's a boycott there. And so what they've done is used the old-fashioned way of growing things. And they produced their food naturally, and now they're producing their food naturally, as far as uh, I could see the latest information that we have about Cuba, and they have a healthy form of diet there. So when you have a society based on greed, and that's capitalism, you're going to have all kinds of problems, because the only thing they're interested in is making a higher and higher profit maximizing their profits, and they'll do it any way they possibly can. If they could, they would poison, they'd sell you poison water and charge you for the air, for the oxygen, if they possibly could. So it depends a lot on the type of society that you have. What we need is economic democracy. In other words, the people that produce the wealth have to own the wealth, not corporations with a handful of people controlling all the wealth of the country. And as long as you have that, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Well, I hope I can find that petition. I don't know where the ladies went. They came late. And floating around. Over there. Just floating around. Okay. Somewhere. I can't see very well. Uh, thank the speaker for her presentation. I have to say, and I'm slightly skeptical of some of the things she said. However, I have heard repeatedly from repeated sources that corn is not the best thing for me to eat. I go to an alternate <coughs> practitioner and he said that repeatedly. I forgot to ask him why, but anyway, he said that and others have said that, uh, who speak about uh, nutrition on TV. Uh, I've been told repeatedly that it's better to eat organic than, none, than things that aren't grown organically. Same kind of same sources. I've been t told repeatedly that it's not a real good idea to eat meat. Uh, meat is not all that good for you and you're better off uh, avoiding it, and generally speaking, I do. Another thing the speaker said is, oh, corporations and governments are like that. Well, tell me something I don't know. That has been said, what, several dozens, maybe hundreds of times, right here at the College of Complexes. Uh, we've heard about uh, scientists. Well, in the United States, Huge numbers of people are willing to sell out for the almighty buck. Another thing is we've got so much insecurity in our system. I know people of extreme talent who've been just laid off or they're a, a consultant. They don't know where their next month's 
income is coming from. So it's a pretty easy for me to be a little bit blasé uh, about people who sell out. Since 1964, I've gotten a check every month. Every month. Not too many people can say that. There's probably five people in the room who can say that. But that is getting to be a small thing. So it's understandable that scientists who have a PhD decide to sell out for a, a, a bunch of money. I mean, I don't agree with it. They're wrong. But huge numbers of people do it. Uh, they can't be as bad as the economists, though. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Andy Anderson. For some of you that may not know me, most of you do. Uh, I've been following uh, and condensing the stories published in Censored News for the last 25 years or so. As you heard our speaker uh, in her brilliant presentation say over and over again, research outside the United States is uh, concentrating on some of these problems. Inside the United States, we live in a media-generated bubble of mythological ignorance. Americans believe fantasy land, fairy tale land. Americans believe certain things that simply are not true. And when we, any of us that are work in the reality-based community, try to present evidence on some of these subjects, we are immediately attacked by people that don't know what kind of research has been done all over the world or how big the database is. The, the, the subject tonight, you know, genetically modified organisms, is just one of the things that is known to be a big disaster in other countries, but they promote the benefits here. Uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing is another one that is a disaster of biblical proportions. Uh, my, now, now, some people ask if I'm expressing an opinion. I'll give you an opinion here, and I, I'm waiting for the knowledge to evolve, but I am of the opinion that fracking is being done for two reasons. One, to get cheap energy, or they tell us it's cheap energy, but two, is it destroys the water table, and then you can uh, sell water that used to be free, you can privatize the water supply. There's a global movement to privatize the water supply. If you can privatize food, privatize water, so far they haven't been able to privatize air. We were still not charged for breathing. But there, uh, we've heard that um, some people and corporations have made a deal in Pennsylvania where they will be trucking in, a, rather, rather piping in water from the Great Lakes because the, the wells, the underground aquifers in, in, in this entire state of Pennsylvania are slated to be destroyed with fracking so that people will not be able to get water for their livestock, their homes, out of their own wells. Fracking is a disaster of biblical proportions and the mainstream press in the United States is not basically not covering it. But uh, we, we prepared a, uh, a, a one page, it's actually uh, four pages, a summary with my brother and I just got this done today. If, if you don't have time to read a hundred books, 50,000 pages of reports off the internet, take one of these with you tonight because it has a sources list. And the title is called Where We Are, September of 2012. It's just a, simply a, a short summary of four basic myths, four basic fairy tales that Americans believe that are known to be ridiculously false all over the world. We've been told, I'll just list them really quick, Project Censor describes the method which is used to promote fairy tales in America. The media, the media sells the myth on all channels 24-7 and they simultaneously black out one, two, five hundred thousand scientists that could debunk that myth instantly if they were given any kind of airtime at all. We still have a lot of people in this country that think George Bush and Dick Cheney were elected. We're elected. That, that's that's a, the first myth. Those two people lost both elections, and they lost uh, they lost in a landslide in 2004. The second myth, of course, is that our patriotic troops are fighting for American freedom. 
based in 700 and 750 military bases all over the world. The troops are come back, coming back committing suicide because they learned that they're not fighting for American freedom. They're muscle for the mob. They're defending corporations that are taking resources from countries all over the world where the people violently object to what is being pushed on them by Monsanto and all the other corporations that promote free, free enterprise capitalism. The third myth, of course, it's in here. As we talked about this before, and there's, there's new information emerging every week from countries all over the world. The third myth that is still being promoted in America is, of course, that HIV is the cause of AIDS. It's not. We had a lot of people die in this country. A lot of people have died from illnesses that were diagnosed as AIDS, but those illnesses were not caused by HIV, and the solutions are being promoted all over the world. Okay. The last one, of course, earlier tonight, uh, Leanne told me she thought the number one myth in America was the myth of HIV, um, the myth of 9-11, and that, of course, I consider that one of our big three. Uh, you know, the architects and engineers, uh, thousands of scientists all over the world have thoroughly debunked the myth. Other countries are setting up tribunals, uh, like Bertrand Russell talked about uh, in the 50s, uh, truth commissions uh, to go after criminals and, uh, you know, bring people to justice. So uh, things are moving forward if we open our minds a little bit and simply look at the evidence. That's all that's necessary. All of these things are understandable. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody wants copies or any of these uh, flyers we have, please come see me uh, before you leave. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys something that I think that most of you already know. I am a capitalist. Oh, I okay. love Ooh, capitalism. Ooh, I capitalism. love the profit motive and the freedom that the marketplace brings. So many GMO foods. What I don't like is fraud. What I don't like is cutting corners to make a profit. What I don't like is market manipulation. I don't like unethical behavior. And I think none of us likes unethical behavior. My point is, I think the modern corporation, the stock market, and the revenue bond have been some of the best investments we've ever had for growth and for the betterment of mankind. And if you don't believe me, it's been in use for 300 plus years to help us develop. It has also, like any tool, can be subject to misuse and mismanagement. And we heard a lot of that case tonight with the subject of Monsanto. However, there is a way that you guys can fight back. And that is every consumer or every corporation exists because somebody spends money to support them by either buying their products or buying their services. And when a company is known to have fraud or to have problems with their customer service problems, most companies will either adapt and change or die. Now, the thing is, a lot of times, a lot of these companies try to rig the system to where they can't compete fairly and compete whatever they want to. They want monopoly practices in, and that's unfair. I mean, if you're going to talk about government subsidies, get rid of it for the corporations as well as the individuals, you know, if you're, if you're so inclined. If you want to get rid of welfare, get rid of it across the board. If you're going to help people out, help the individual, but keep the companies out of it. Now, for example, we're going to talk about, for example, the automobile bailouts. I was for it, but the reason was the government cut a deal that they were venture capitalists of last resort. They still have ownership of the companies, and in the last round of stock buying, they actually made a substantial profit from the automotive makers. That, to me, is a win-win for government bailouts. However, again, you know, you guys come in here, you, you buy a car, you're on an expressway, you have free selection of food. The only reason this restaurant exists is because we come in here, we produce the revenue, somebody makes a little profit on it, they come into their jobs, and they make a little money doing what they're doing. I can think of no better reason 
for somebody to go to work or for somebody to provide a good service and to get a little cash out of the deal. It's been, the, it's been that way since time immemorial with the invention of the modern marketplace as well as other items. Nobody likes fraud and if the marketplace is allowed to function properly, you usually weed out the bad apples. I love capitalism. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm pretty much in agreement with my friend uh, Tim there. Uh, now, Sid was up here saying that, you know, the, the free, uh, free market capitalism is based on greed and, you know, all this, but yet it's free market capitalism that has given us this abundance of food that we've enjoyed here in the United States since 1776, at least. Uh, and it get, uh, ironically, all the countries that have had mass starvations, Russia, China, Vietnam, North Korea, Cuba, you know, anything else, what do they have in common? All communist countries, right? When you take the profit motive out, look what happens. Uh, so I think, I think our speaker, you know, means well, but again, I think she's been infected with the Marxism bug. She has a mistrust of profit motive, and she also has a, uh, you know, she's also kind of inflicted with this fear of scientific progress, which has been going on forever, right? I mean, so we came out with electricity, there were people that were afraid of electricity. Well, this can do that. Vaccinations, uh, microwave ovens, you know, cell phones. Now it's, you know, genetically modified foods. Uh, so, and there's another thing, along with the distrust of the free market, uh, is also one of, of uh, unawareness uh, of trade-offs. Now, some of these rats that are dying from eating corn, now we have to see those studies. My, my guess is they probably stuffed these rats with the equivalent, uh, you know, a lot of corn would be like if we would eat like a, have a 10 pound feed bag uh, of corn on our face every day and eat that for, you know, 50 years or something, yeah, you might get something. But there's trade-offs. Do you want a, you know, when you go to the store, you, know, you can tell the difference between an organic piece of produce and a genetically modified piece of produce. Look at, a, look at an organic apple, it'll be small, tasteless, have a few wormholes in it, it'll be half rotted. You know, then you look at a genetically modified apple, it'll be huge, you know, luscious, perfect, sweet, succulent, bright red, tasty, you know, you snap that apple and juice is running down your face. Fucking delicious, right? That's a little fucking shriveled up, rotted thing with, filled with worms, you know. And so the thing is, you know, it's trade off. You know, maybe this genetically modified apple, if I ate about a fucking bushel of them every day for 50 years, it might do something to me. I might get the shits from it. But, yeah, you might. But, you know, so it's one of trade offs. If I decide I would rather have that apple and probably pay like, you know, 59 cents a pound for that apple versus, you know, 4 99 a pound for these organic things. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of trade-offs. So I, I, know, I mean, I'm not going to live to be a thousand years old, so, uh, you know, maybe if I have one, of the, one or two of these apples a week, I don't think it's going to, you know, it's going to hurt, but that's my decision to make. Uh, I suppose, you know, we could go with the labeling. I'm kind of, you know, I, I figure if you put a label on it that says it's organic, that means it's not GMO. So anything else is GMO. Uh, so anyway, it hasn't, uh, hasn't killed me yet. And again, with my uh, examples of uh, fish and the strawberry gene, again, you know, you know, this gene, the particular gene, is found in a fish that keeps this fish from freezing, you know, under a certain temperature. If you take that gene out and put it over here in the strawberry, logically, it seems to be pretty hard to stretch that it's going to be like more dangerous if the gene is instead of here is over here, and you know, inserted in this other uh, living organism. So. I don't see how, you know, having, you know, so it doesn't really make that much sense to me uh, in that respect. So, anyway, but uh, thanks. I wish our speaker was here so I could thank her, though, for an excellent, otherwise an excellent presentation.
I'm Mike Bowley. I was thinking about talking tonight, but I decided not to. I was going to talk about how Drew Peterson is sitting in jail, even though no one accused him of committing any crime. I was going to talk about how Drew Peterson is sitting in jail, even though the prosecutors that prosecuted him said there might not have even been any crime. Anyway, I was going to talk about how our government had helicopters flying around downtown Chicago last May. Guys were sitting in that helicopter trying to practice to kill people walking around on the ground. And our government told us that was all members of the United States Armed Forces doing that. And I was going to talk about how Mayor Emanuel and Police Superintendent McCarthy told us that the FBI, CIA, ATF, DEA, and Internal Revenue was going to come here to assist the Chicago Police Department, which means they were going to take it over. Yeah. An FBI agent soon, if not a, if it's not already happened, an FBI agent will soon walk in to police headquarters and say, I am in charge, I am running the Chicago Police Department, and that's going to be that. I was also going to mention that last Saturday was the 77th anniversary of the enactment of the Nuremberg Laws in Germany, and that is significant, although I won't go into it because it's an awful long story. And I was going to say I have to nitpick with my own self because I have said many times that we have no more rights in this country. We no longer have rights in this country. The nitpicking part is that's not true. We have rights. It's just that our government does not acknowledge that we have rights. Our government violates our rights. If you're sitting in a cell like Drew Peterson, it's no consolation to know that you have rights and your government is violating them. The fact is you're still sitting in the cell and you're being violated. But anyway, I decided not to talk about any of that stuff until Tim started running his mouth about capitalism and then Bob Matters started running his mouth about capitalism. <laughs> I've got to remark on that. Tim, you're full of BS and Bob Matters, you're full of BS. You don't know anything about capitalism because you've never lived anywhere where there's capitalism. The United States of America is a welfare country. It's based on bribery and armed robbery. And when I say welfare, I'm not talking about women that live in high-rise buildings with three or four kids. General Motors got a welfare check for $175 billion. If there was capitalism, there wouldn't be any more world, uh, General Motors. Chrysler got a welfare check for billions. AIG got a welfare check for $175 billion. The ten biggest banks in this country are on welfare. If it was capitalism, J.P. Morgan would be gone, Chase Manhattan would be gone. The, Northern Trust Company in this city, which is supposedly one of the best banks, most sound bank in this country, they took the welfare check from the government in 2008. Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Bank of America, they're all on welfare. If there was capitalism, there wouldn't be any of those banks, General Motors. Chrysler's on his second bailout. Remember Lee Iacocca? He was going to save Chrysler, save the world. He saved it on government money is what he said. And he paid it all back. That may or may not be true. The fact is, if it wasn't given to them in the first place, there wouldn't have been no Chrysler anymore. The government made money on the Chrysler deal. They were venture capitalists. It doesn't matter. There. If we were a capitalist country, none of that would have happened. Right. Chrysler would have been long ass gone, and it would have been over. They're now making better cars. They did had a good deal. They made money on the auto bail. One fool at a time. Shut up, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> The Tribune Empire is based on armed robbery. Sam Zell decided he didn't want to pay his bills anymore. He owes two or three billion dollars. He decided he was broke, so he didn't want to pay the bills. So he sent some lawyers to a judge in Delaware, said we're bankrupt. The judge wrote out a piece of paper, said Tribune Company does not have to pay the creditors. And sent government gunslingers to the creditors to serve them with the paper, saying Tribune Company does not have to pay the bills. Tribune Company's been in bankruptcy for four years, and they're making so much money every once in a while, Sam Gell, Sam go, goes to court, sends the lawyers to court, and says, Judge, we're making so much money. I want to give bonuses to all the wonderful employees of Tribune Company. And the judge says, okay. They're making all that money. They still don't have to pay the creditors. Okay, so I'm about done. But this is not a capitalist country. This is a welfare company. As long as you pay bribes to the politicians, 
They'll write you checks, welfare checks, for billions. And if you piss that away, they'll write you more welfare checks for more billions. This is not a capitalist country. Uh, I love this group. Uh, there's no fear to say anything. And, uh, uh, don't, don't feel being embarrassed or something. So, uh, any thoughts can be speak out here. Uh, I just had a couple of crazy thoughts uh, after the talk. Uh, why is uh, the, the I just thought about uh, the uh, Monsanto seeds cannot pr reproduce uh, the next uh, generation seeds. So some technology is there, and uh, but I, I forgot to ask whether this technology will affect uh, people or animals eating that food. Uh, so that may be a potentially slow down the population growth or something effect on that. Anybody heard anything from that? Yeah, actually I just saw some research out by being published by Russia saying that it shows pictures of the uh, rat's testicles and is showing that they, um, it is affecting the reproduction cycles of the rats who are eating it as well as um, the growth of the babies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear more evidence uh, on those and also more about the technology side because we know uh, they change the species by just hybrid, hybrid that's more natural and sometimes by radiation to stimulate the, the uh, genetic uh, 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 changes or some other technology or even today's uh, genetic modification, you, you put needles uh, to, to take DNA from here and uh, plant it there. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to know more technology, how different technology may have uh, some uh, effect. Like one thing I still don't know, uh, like uh, watermelon, uh, we got lots of uh, seedless watermelon and uh, I have never no. heard about that when I was very young, but then gradually it becomes uh, available. And uh, I don't know how those uh, watermelon would grow. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so I don't know if we, we probably ate lots of uh, seedless watermelon, and uh, I don't know what the effect on my body and my son eats only seedless uh, watermelon. He refused to eat uh, any seeded. <laughs> so those are on technology side. And also, if we put some imagination in the future, uh, I only heard today about uh, genetically modified uh, uh, grains or corns or vegetables or is there genetic modified uh, animals, uh, pigs or cows or something, maybe in the future? Or even more, someday maybe human can have a gen genetically modified uh, human species. And, uh, so next generation will be smarter. I'll take that as you can, sweetheart. Beautiful or whatever, okay. be longer or less. Uh, that's just uh, the genet, uh, my <coughs> imagination. Thank you. Because science, Thank you, my science darling. scientists always try to create something new. It's not. It's difficult to stop that. Uh, the only thing we want to stop is uh, the the big corporations try to benefit on something uh, in proper way, and uh, I think uh, that's. That's what we want to pay attention to. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to be close.
eclectic as usual. There's all many facets to this topic here. My interest in agriculture, as I told you, started when I was right out of college. I ended up in a rural area. As a matter of fact, the dairy farm. And I've maintained something of an interest in agriculture ever since. Not that I'm a, a gentleman farmer by any sense, but as a matter of fact, one of the first speakers I scheduled at the College of Complexes when I took on this little job was someone from the Moo organization, the Milk Outrage organization, about this thing called BGH. Now, what I went tonight and what we learned at the session many years ago was that apparently you cannot distinguish milk from normal dairy cows and cows which have been given BGH. Now, certainly cows that are given BGH, <clears throat> there can be harmful side effects. However, the milk is identical. And the problem they ran into was you can't put a label on your product that would indicate that it has some feature that even means like your competitor's milk is no good and things like that. It actually was a false advertising, is how the case was decided. And that's why they have that little right. kicker in there. And that, that's really, I don't even think that's right. Either you have two types of milk or you don't have a label. Because I think, in essence, we all want truth in advertising and certainly want food labeling. And it wasn't established. And that was just an interesting case. Um, until such time as you can truly establish that there is a harmful effect. Now that leads me into the next topic. Now tonight, uh, I heard there's not one study that indicates whatever genetically modified food means is harmful for us. Not one bit of evidence can you produce that establishes it, then why do we know it's dangerous? Is it a feeling, this is a term I use all the time in the cases I have, is it a feeling you have in your heart? You have no evidence. You have nothing. You have, and then again, I say, well, if I eat this genetically modified food, will I get sick? Now you tell me at least, at least, I've got to be concerned about my testicles. <laughs> 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 now that's a genuine thing, that's, that's the first solid thing I've heard. <laughs> that might make some concern on my part. <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. But I'm serious. Now, if you have no illness, then what is the... Why should I exercise fear? Or should I exercise a lot of fear? Or what quantity will produce an illness? More like Bob's eating these apples all the, every day, or is it an enormous quantity? Now, it doesn't mean that uh, there aren't dangers in food. Our, our speaker actually hit on it. She did identify possibly the most dangerous food, genetically modified or not, is certainly as strawberries. We had a speaker on that, as a matter of fact, an entire evening. So she was right on the money in that regard. And then I, this other thing that I don't know, I've been bouncing around the academic community for a number of years, and I don't know exactly how they were, they were able to, to get to the entire academic world of all these schools of agriculture, and there's a lot of them, let me tell you, land-grant colleges, that somehow they got to all the researchers uh, and all the government agencies at the federal, state, and local over there's ag agents and every everybody. This is a conspiracy of magnificent scale. I mean, this is this is one heck of a conspiracy. This involves a number of numbers of people. Now, are we in fact going into a new world? Yes. Is it certainly what you consume important? Without a doubt. Uh, has any of this been established as? Dangerous or not, it, the, up to this point, the burden of proof lies with the, the anti-GMO people. And you've got a little more work to do ahead of you. It, I haven't heard anything here, and 
other than this great, well, it was a conspiracy. Now, are there in fact practices regarding GMO that are harmful in agriculture? Yes. There's no till and the this, this stomping of seed. It's a highly, already? All right, I'll wrap it up. There's a lot of bad things in agriculture that goes on. Is Monsanto a bad corporation? Unquestionably. Uh, are they out to monopolize the seed industry? Yes, they've got their eyes on the prize. Um, they're looking to, to capture everything. Uh, the other side of the coin is, there is a serious food problem in the world. And this is new technology that does have promise of solving that problem. Now the United Nations Agenda 21 is to give every child on earth, and I mean this, there's, a, there's thousands, tens of thousands of children that die every day for lack of nutrition in the world. 40 to 50,000 a day, and their idea was just to get a cup of food like this. Uh, to, at least once a day to every child on earth. That's the goal that they're aiming towards. And is it achievable through this GMO? Let's hope it can. Um, the other thing is there's climate change coming about. Is, is this genetic engineering is a thing? It certainly is a lot better than the old-fashioned ways of collecting seed corns and doing it every year and things like that. That was wonderful in 1900. But this is 2012. Thanks and to your corporate if we can accelerate practices. the process, you know, uh, I say let's go about it. Are there probably going to be some negative effects? Unquestionably. There's money to be made, and somebody is going to care less whether you and I die. Let's face it, you know, that's capitalism. Okay, okay Charlie, that's what time's up. Do. All right, then who are you? Put your charge to the college, like that guy told you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm worried about my testicles. <laughs> 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 uh, I like Corey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do they work that? Your wife suddenly gets on and you like. First of all, with regard to the comments that were made by the Hoosier in the room, um, he seems to want us to return to a world in which we Charlie, one fool at a time, please. <laughs> he seems to want us to return to a world in which you get to disagree with your critics by accusing them of Marxism or communism or whatever. Uh, I'm sorry. It's because somebody has the affrontery to criticize a company like Monsanto does not make them a Marxist. <laughs> and if anything, where fraud is concerned, and I'm, and I'm satisfied that Monsanto is perpetuating that on a gargantuan scale, I'm sorry, it's not Marxism to point it out. Uh, if you want to eat, eat those apples, you can go right ahead. In, in that case, I would say an apple a day probably brings on the doctor. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. And apparently, uh, also, he wants to return to a world in which DuPont can get away with promoting things like better things through better living through chemistry. Instead, we should pay more attention to people like his cousin, Dwight Eisenhower, who, at the, who at, during his farewell address on his last day in office in 1961, warned us of the, of the growing dangers of a military-industrial complex, which now would seem to embrace the agriculture industry as well. Um, a reference was made also to the fact that uh, corn, uh, in its primitive state, was basically a plant with a few kernels on it. That was wild corn. You can't really, you can't find that anymore, period. It's pretty much been wiped out. It's been hybridized, and other things done to it. And it's not the simple grass that it once was. Uh, with regard to how was it that Monsanto was able to uh, corrupt the agricultural departments at all the various universities by spreading money around? This isn't news. This has been going on since the robber baron era at the turn of the last century. 
where at one university they had a great debate of whether they should take a grant from a prominent robber baron, and somebody shouted that it was tainted money, and one of the other professors stood up and said, bring on your tainted money. <laughs> uh, with regard to Drew Peterson, Peterson is in jail for one reason. A jury said that he was guilty of murder. And as far as I'm concerned, that's it, period, end of story. I, he, I'm sure I have no doubt that the case will be appealed, but for right now, a jury has said that he's guilty, plain and simple. And I agree with the jury's verdict. Finally, for those folks, finally, for those folks who are wondering whether science sometimes, how shall I say this, whether it takes them down, I'm not an opponent of science or a believer in the attack on science. Sometimes it takes them down areas that they might want to think twice about. If you want a fictional example, I'll give you one. When I was a boy over 50 years ago, I, Shirley Temple, who by that point was a 30-year-old woman, was the host of a television series that ran, I believe, on NBC called Shirley Temple Storybook Theater. And it presented stories for children, one of, most of which were adopted from fairy tales or other things of that, of that nature. And one of the stories that they presented was a story called The Terrible Clock Man, which basically told the story of a medieval clock, well, not a medieval, a renaissance clockmaker, who in Amsterdam demonstrated to his friends a new robot he had built with a clockwork mechanism and the, of the face of a clock. And he said, see, it all started as a mechanical heart beating. Well, the inevitable happened. He couldn't control it. The robot went out and terrorized the town and eventually they had to destroy it. So, I commend that thought to your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay. Like renegade robots? I think we're going to have to re get, get some different ideas of both government and market before we can come to groups with this problem. Our speaker said the government didn't have anything to do with it. We hear all this stuff about revolving doors and massive fraud. Uh, I don't know what it's going to do, but I'm surprised a few people around here, but fraud is actually contrary to the free market. Somebody got the Rubik's Cube? No, you know, I'm can't go into all the ins and outs of that. But I think just to be a little bit of act, act, act like uh, as far as regulation is concerned, there's a book that came out about 50 years ago called The Triumph of Conservatism by Gabriel Falco, who says that the progressive era bureaucracies that were put in, uh, instituted about a hundred years ago were not because of outraged populace, but because of the very interest that they were brought about by the very interest they were supposedly to regulate. And the FDA was supposed to control uh, make it safe for uh, large food processors and you know to put out wipe out the small businesses that would uh, <coughs> about the small businesses that would compete with them. I mean, this is where I got the idea of the capitalist union. You wipe out your competition, you create a cartel. You use the regulation in the name of something else, a kind of a false flag operation. 
do that. I suppose we can stand here and go through a number of false flag operations that actually do things that they're not intended to do, or they're supposedly intended to do. But anyway, uh, I'm not looking for some great big. I think I think what, what what you have to understand about the market, it's not just the domination of the of the corporation as vast as they may be. But every corporation requires the cooperation of customers, workers and suppliers and so on. But customers in particular. And I think we should, we should be, it might be rough to try to find some other source of seed than uh, the genetically modified seeds. But uh, it seems from what I hear tonight anyway, sounds like a worthwhile effort. There's been a lot of uh, efforts to uh, create seed banks. Uh, store, uh, I guess it's he, well, what I've heard is that in case there's a war or something, that there's going to be seeds around that can be replanted and uh, get back into business again. But uh, I don't know how much. You do to withdraw cooperation. <coughs> if your drinking water has been poisoned and everything else, but maybe we should really think about these things before it gets too far. Okay, wrap it up, Phil. time here and not much of a public speaker. But I just wanted to share a few things that I found recently. Um, there are studies that have been published and that are now coming out. One of them is by Cryogen, it's C-R-I-I-G-E-N. It's a French company and they've been able to study the full life cycle of rats that have been fed GMO corn and they're finding cancer very widespread in these rats, tumors that are huge, very abnormal, and you should just check it out. There's um, some YouTube videos out there that are well documented, they're well researched, they're scientists, uh, and just at least watch them and make your opinion from there, or form your opinion from there. Another one um, is what I was talking about having to do with testicles. Uh, the laboratory test by the Russian National Academy of Sciences reported that more than half the babies from mother rats fed GMO, fed GM, or genetically modified soy, died within three weeks. The babies in the genetic modified group were also smaller and could not reproduce. Rats fed a commercial rat chow using GM or genetically modified soy within two months had infant mortality facility-wide reaching 55%. I think that's pretty significant. And these, I mean, they're using the rats to do studies that are approving these genetically modified foods for us. It's very, and they've only done, they've only used the rats within a certain time frame, I think uh, within a three month time frame, and they don't actually start seeing the results until four months. So it's very interesting that uh, there's independent groups that are not funded by uh, the large corporate pushers that are coming up with some very interesting research, and I just suggest you look into it. Thank you. Four Brown speaks, we're going to have our, our this young, young lady over here represents, since she is part of the issue, she'll represent our speaker's last word since our speaker had to leave early. Okay. Uh, Jesus. 
Yeah, the, the last little bit. GMO Sula. No, nothing GMO. Couple. Well, Brian. Timer. GMO makes a little work to do it. Ah. Anyway. Poor politicians. They really get lambasted. And uh, the, the fault is not just with the politicians. And uh, capitalist politicians live in a society. They have to, uh, to, to be a politician, you have to get votes. To get votes, you have to be noticed. You have to have supporters. You have to have organization. And it all costs money. It costs money in advertising. It costs money to see people, to get on the, the uh, stage uh, when uh, there are groups of people assembled. Uh, to be known and to to be on the ballot takes time and money. It's a lot of work uh, to stay on if you get elected. To get reelected uh, gets uh, t takes time and money, uh, and uh, so it's a big temptation. Uh, for uh, an honest politician, and there are many, I mean, if you're going to accomplish anything in a, a legislature or uh, in a other elective office, you have to you have to continue in that office, uh, not be voted out uh, for uh, insufficient. Uh, reason or cause. Uh, pray for them. What? The honest politician. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look what does that have to do with pray? Look <laughs> to see. I gotta pray. Pray. Uh, pray. And you. If you can't pray, you can't. Uh, it takes thinking. It takes putting yourself in the place of somebody else. They said P R E Y or P R A Y. P R A Y. P R A Y. Should I pray for a Obama yeah, or a Romney? Trying. One fool at a time. Yes, one fool at a time. Pray for the Obama. Romney. Without any further ado, I give you our final. Yeah, Speaker okay. representative. Representative. All right. So my name is Jessica. Jessica Fuyan again. My name is Jessica Fuyan. Thanks again for letting me come here. And um, while Leanne was kind enough to invite me to talk about GMOs, because I have the microphone in my hand, I'm going to use my my last few minutes to talk about the campaign a little bit. Because if you care about GM uh, GMO food, then I suppose you don't want to be eating it, and that's a really important thing. Um, and so I want to say that from the stance of Food and Water Watch, we see that GM food is untested and um, un potentially unsafe for human consumption. I want to refer back to what you were saying about the test that was recently released with rats with tumors a third of their body size. If that's the kind of thing that's happening to rats who were fed GMO corn for two years, imagine what's happening to children who have lived their entire lives where about 85% of foods that are processed and on the shelves at the grocery store contain some GE product. That's horrifying. So um, from the stance of Food and Water Watch, what we're trying to come out with now is that we're not trying to say that like GMO foods are causing autism because we don't know that. There aren't a lot of good studies about the effects of GM foods on humans because it was introduced into the food system and into our grocery stores in a way that was unlabeled. And we can't test something we don't know we're eating. We can't um, find a lot of test subjects who have never eaten GE food, right? It's hard to, it's hard to say. And so our perspective is um, you've got to let us decide. If we're living in, in, a, in a democracy, like some people were saying, if we're living in a uh, society that thrives on intelligence and consumer knowledgeability, then we need to have 
um, the ability to distinguish between GE foods or GMO foods and regular foods. Um, and so at Food and Water Watch, what we're trying to say is, you know, we, we don't think we have the money, for instance. Um, I think a lot of talk of people talked about the fact that these biotech companies have more money than, <laughs> than some small governments. <laughs> Um, we don't have the money to take them on and take them down personally, but what we do have is the right to know what we're putting in our bodies, and so do you. You guys have this right as well. But before, um, before now, people haven't made a big stand about it. People have not stood up um, in concert to demand the right to know. Um, so the, the name of our campaign is Let Me Decide. I hope that you all want to decide. Um, between foods that are genetically modified and that are natural at the store. Um, and we hope that this campaign, um, this campaign for everyone in this room is a no-brainer. Am I right? People want to know what's in their food. And their elected representatives are also people who eat <laughs> and know the difference between genetically modified and not. Um, and so this campaign is a no-brainer, but it will take the support of people over the money that Monsanto can potentially throw at our candidates. So um, until very recently, we weren't really talking about this campaign publicly. So be careful what you do with this video, <laughs> right? Because um, part of the reason, I'm gonna be honest, so you really be careful what you do with this video. It's gonna be posted live. So, uh, really? I'll maybe let, I better stop now. I'll let it, I can edit out certain If you portions. could edit this part out, that okay, would Okay, I will. So we started with um, the aldermen because from what we understand at Food and Water Watch, the aldermen don't receive money right now from Cargill and Monsanto, but they could, they easily could. In California, they're having a hell of a time because um, Monsanto is throwing millions and millions of dollars into ad campaigns trying to confuse people about environmentalists who want to scare them about food that is uh, ostensibly the same as food that is naturally grown. And so we really need to make a stand um, right now while we have representatives who are not being paid off by Monsanto because when we get to the state legislature, it will be a lot harder. Those are people who do receive a lot of money from, from the companies that create GE Foods. So I hope that you guys uh, are inspired about this issue after hearing so many of your friends and colleagues talk um, and have a ton of information and that you will contact your older person. I know that I have contacted mine on a number of occasions, and <laughs> we're great friends. Give us, give us your website and the place where we can get more information. Great. So, um, uh, the Food and uh, Food and Water Watch has a research team in Washington, D.C., who does triple fact checking. Everything is um, pure gold. It's all cited in the back of our fact sheet. So you can find a one-page fact sheet with a one-page citation guide. So you can trace back our research all the way to the beginning. Um, the website is available, if you'd like my card, is foodandwaterwatch.org, foodandwaterwatch.org, and again, my name is Jessica Fuyan, so I'm in the Chicago, I am a Midwest organizer, I organize in Chicago and Minnesota, so um, I would love to talk to more people in the future about this issue, if you are looking for facts and information, please visit our website, again, thank you for having me, and thank you, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> for letting me know about this awesome event. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this concludes uh, this session of the Housing Complex. That's how concentration, uh, that's how high the concentration of wealth is. And when you have that type of wealth, you could uh, buy off any politician you want. You could buy off any, uh, any, any uh, part of the government. And capital controls everything. And that's what you have today. Now, they had uh, problems in Cuba years ago where they couldn't get the seeds and they couldn't get different things because there's a boycott there. And so what they done is used the old-fashioned way of growing things. And they produced their food naturally, and now they're producing their food naturally as far as uh, I could see the latest information that we have about Cuba.
and they have a healthy form of diet there. So when you have a society based on greed, and that's capitalism, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Because the only thing they're interested in is making a higher and higher profit, maximizing their profits. And they'll do it any way they possibly can. If they could, they would poison, they'd sell you poison water and charge you for the air, for the oxygen, if they possibly could. So it depends a lot on the type of society that you have. What we need is economic democracy. In other words, the people that produce the wealth have to own the wealth, not corporations with a handful of people controlling all the wealth of the country. And as long as you have that, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Well, I hope I can find that petition. I don't know where the ladies went. They came late. It's floating around. It's floating around. Floating around. Okay, somewhere. I can't see very well. Uh, thank the speaker for her presentation. I have to say, and I'm slightly skeptical of some of the things she said. However, I have heard repeatedly from repeated sources that corn is not the best thing for me to eat. I go to an alternate <coughs> practitioner and he said that repeatedly. I forgot to ask him why, but anyway, he said that and others have said that uh, who speak about a nutrition on TV. Uh, I've been told repeatedly that it's better to eat organic than none than things that aren't grown organically. Same kind of same sources. I've been t told repeatedly that it's not a real good idea to eat meat. Uh, meat is not all that good for you, and you're better off uh, avoiding it. And generally speaking, I do. Another thing the speaker said is. Oh, corporations and governments are like that. Well, tell me something I don't know. That has been said, what, several dozens, maybe hundreds of times, right here at the College of Complexes. Uh, we've heard about uh, scientists. Well, in the United States, huge numbers of people are willing to sell out for the almighty buck. Another thing is we've got so much insecurity in our system. I know people of extreme talent who've been just laid off or they're a, a consultant. They don't know where their next month's income is coming from. So it's pretty easy for me to be a little bit blasé uh, about people who sell out. Since 1964, I've gotten a check every month, every month. Not too many people can say that. There's probably five people in the room who can say that. But that is getting to be a small thing. So it's understandable that scientists who have a PhD decide to sell out for a, a, a bunch of money. I mean, I don't agree with it. They're wrong. But huge numbers of people do it. Uh, they can't be as bad as the economists, though. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Andy Anderson. For some of you that may not know me, most of you do. Uh, I've been following uh, and condensing the stories published in Censored News for the last 25 years or so. As you heard our speaker uh, in her brilliant presentation say over and over again, research outside the United States is uh, concentrating on some of these problems. Inside the United States, we live in a media-generated bubble of mythological ignorance. Americans believe fantasy land, fairy tale land. Americans believe certain things that simply are not true. And when we any of us that are work in the reality-based community try to present evidence on some of these subjects, we are immediately attacked by people that don't know what kind of research has been done all over the world, or 
how big the database is. The, the, the subject tonight, uh, genetically modified organisms, is just one of the things that is known to be a big disaster in other countries, but they promote the benefits here. Uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing is another one that is a disaster of biblical proportions. Uh, my, now, now, some people ask if I'm expressing an opinion. I'll give you an opinion here, and I, I'm waiting for the knowledge to evolve, but I am of the opinion that fracking is being done for two reasons. One, to get cheap energy, or they tell us it's cheap energy, but two, is it destroys the water table, and then you can uh, sell water that used to be free, you can privatize the water supply. There's a global movement to privatize the water supply. If you can privatize food, privatize water, so far they haven't been able to privatize air. We were still not charged for breathing. But there, uh, we've heard that um, some people in corporations have made a deal in Pennsylvania where they will be trucking in, a, rather, rather piping in water from the Great Lakes because the, the wells, the underground aquifers in, in, in this entire state of Pennsylvania are slated to be destroyed with fracking so that people will not be able to get water for their livestock, their homes, out of their own wells. Fracking is a disaster of biblical proportions and the mainstream press in the United States is not basically not covering it. But uh, we, we prepared a, uh, a, a one page, it's actually uh, four pages, a summary, when my brother and I just got this done today, if, if you don't have time to read 100 books, 50,000 pages of reports off the internet, take one of these with you tonight because it has a sources list. And the title is called Where We Are, September of 2012. It's just a, simply a, a short summary of four basic myths, four basic fairy tales that Americans believe that are known to be ridiculously false all over the world. We've been told, I'll just list them really quick, Project Censor describes the method which is used to promote fairy tales in America. The media, the media sells the myth on all channels 24-7 and they simultaneously black out one, two, five hundred, a thousand scientists that could debunk that myth instantly if they were given any kind of airtime at all. We still have a lot of people in this country that think George Bush and Dick Cheney were elected. We're elected. Yeah. That's, that's a, the first myth. Those two people lost both elections, and they lost, uh, they lost in a landslide in 2004. The second myth, of course, is that our patriotic troops are fighting for American freedom based in 700, 750 military bases all over the world. The troops are come back, coming back committing suicide because they learned that they're not fighting for American freedom. They're muscle for the mob. They're defending corporations that are taking resources from countries all over the world where the people violently object to what is being pushed on them by Monsanto and all the other corporations that promote free, free enterprise capitalism. The third myth, of course, it's in here. As we talked about this before, and there's there's new information emerging every week from countries all over the world. The third myth that is still being promoted in America is, of course, that HIV is the cause of AIDS. It's not. We have a lot of people die in this country. A lot of people have died from illnesses that were diagnosed as AIDS, but those illnesses were not caused by HIV, and the solutions are being promoted all over the world. The last one, of course, Earlier tonight, uh, Leanne told me she thought the number one myth in America was the myth of HIV, um, the myth of 9/11, and that, of course, I consider that one of our big three. Uh, you know, the, the architects and engineers, uh, thousands of scientists all over the world have thoroughly debunked the myth. Other countries are setting up tribunals, uh, like Bertrand Russell talked about uh, in the 50s. Uh, truth commissions uh, to go after criminals and uh, you know bring people to justice. So uh, things are moving forward if we open our minds a little bit and simply look at the evidence. That's all that's necessary. All of these things are understandable.
Thank you. Yeah. Anybody wants copies or any of these uh, flyers we have, please come see me uh, before you leave. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys something that I think that most of you already know. I am a capitalist. Oh, okay. I love Ooh, capitalism. Ooh, I love capitalism. the profit motive and the freedom that the marketplace brings. So many GMO foods. What I don't like is fraud. What I don't like is cutting corners to make a profit. What I don't like is market manipulation. I don't like unethical behavior. And I think none of us likes unethical behavior. My point is, I think the modern corporation, the stock market, and the revenue bond have been some of the best investments we've ever had for growth and for the betterment of mankind. And if you don't believe me, it's been in use for 300 plus years to help us develop. It has also, like any tool, can be subject to misuse and mismanagement. And we heard a lot of that case tonight with the subject of Monsanto. However, there is a way that you guys can fight back. And that is every consumer or every corporation exists because somebody spends money to support them by either buying their products or buying their services. And when a company is known to have fraud or to have problems with their customer service problems, most companies will either adapt and change or die. Now, the thing is, a lot of times, a lot of these companies try to rig the system to where they can't compete fairly and compete whatever they want. To, they want monopoly practices in, and that's unfair. I mean, if you're going to talk about government subsidies, get rid of it for the corporations as well as the individuals, you know, if you're, if you're so inclined. If you want to get rid of welfare, get rid of it across the board. If you're going to help people out, help the individual, but keep the companies out of it. Now, for example, we're going to talk about, for example, the automobile bailouts. I was for it, but the reason was the government cut a deal that they were venture capitalists of last resort. They still have ownership of the companies, and in the last round of stock buying, they actually made a substantial profit from the automotive makers. That, to me, is a win-win for government bailouts. However, again, you know, you guys come in here, you, you buy a car, you're on an expressway, you have free selection of food. The only reason this restaurant exists is because we come in here, we produce the revenue, somebody makes a little profit on it, they come into their jobs, and they make a little money doing what they're doing. I can think of no better reason for somebody to go to work or for somebody to provide a good service than to get a little cash out of the deal. It's been, the, it's been that way since time immemorial with the invention of the modern marketplace, as well as other items. Nobody likes fraud, and if the marketplace is allowed to function properly, you usually weed out the bad apples. I love capitalism. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm pretty much in agreement with my friend uh, Tim there. Uh, now, Sid was up here saying that, you know, the, the free, uh, free market capitalism is based on greed and, you know, all this, but yet it's free market capitalism that has given us this abundance of food that we've enjoyed here in the United States since 1776, at least. Uh, and it get, uh, ironically, all the countries that have had mass starvations, Russia, China, Vietnam, North Korea, Cuba, you know, anything else, what do they have in common? All communist countries, right? When you take the profit motive out, look what happens. Uh, so I think, I think our speaker, you know, means well, but again, I think she's been infected with the Marxism bug. She has a mistrust of profit motive. And she also has a, uh, you know, she's also kind of inflicted with this fear of scientific progress, which has been going on forever, right? I mean, so we came out with electricity. There were people that were afraid of electricity. Well, this can do that. 
vaccinations, uh, microwave ovens, you know, cell phones. Now it's you know genetically modified foods. Uh, so it was another thing, along with the distrust of the free market, uh, is also one of, of uh, un uh, awareness of trade-offs. Now. Some of these rats that are dying from eating corn, now we have to see those studies. My, my guess is they probably stuffed these rats with the equivalent, uh, you know, amount of corn to be like if we would eat like a, have a 10 pound feed bag uh, of corn on our face every day and eat that for, you know, 50 years or something. Yeah, you might get something. But there's trade-offs. Do you want a, you know, when you go to the store, you, know, you can tell the difference between an organic piece of produce and a genetically modified piece of produce. Wow. Look at a, look at an organic apple. It'll be small, tasteless, have a few wormholes in it. It'll be half rotted. You know, then you look at a genetically modified apple. It'll be huge. You know, luscious, perfect, sweet, succulent, bright red, tasty. You know, snap that apple and juice is running down your face. Fucking delicious, right? That's a little fucking shriveled up, rotted thing with filled with worms. You know. And so the thing is, you know, it's trade-offs. You know, maybe this genetically modified apple, if I ate about a fucking bushel of them every day for 50 years, it might do something to me. I might get the shits from it. But Yeah, you might. But, you know, so it's one of trade-offs. If I decide I would rather have that apple and probably pay, like, you know, 59 cents a pound for that apple versus, you know, 4.99 a pound for these organic things, uh... You know, it's a, it's one of trade offs. So I, I you know, I mean, I'm not going to live to be a thousand years old. So, uh, you know, maybe if I have one of the one or two of these apples a week, I don't think it's going to, you know, it's going to hurt. But that's my decision to make. Uh, I suppose you know we could go with the labeling. I'm kind of you know, I, I figure if you put a label on it that says it's organic, that means it's not GMO. So anything else is GMO. Uh, so anyway, hasn't uh, hasn't killed me yet. And again, with my uh, examples of uh, the fish and the strawberry gene, again, you know, you know, this gene, the particular gene is found in a fish that keeps this fish from freezing, you know, under a certain temperature. If you take that gene out and put it over here in the strawberry, logically it seems to be a pretty hard stretch that it's going to be, like, more dangerous if the gene is, instead of here, is over here, it, you know, inserted in this other uh, living organism. So... I don't see how, you know, having, you know, so it doesn't really make that much sense to me uh, in that respect. So, anyway, but uh, thanks. I wish our speaker was here so I could thank her, though, for an excellent, otherwise an excellent presentation. I'm Mike Borley. I was thinking about talking tonight, but I decided not to. I was going to talk about how Drew Peterson is sitting in jail even though no one accused him of committing any crime. <laughs> I was going to talk about how Drew Peterson is sitting in jail even though the prosecutors that prosecuted him said there might not have even been any crime. Anyway, I was going to talk about how our government had helicopters flying around downtown Chicago last May. Guys were sitting in that helicopter trying to practice to kill people walking around on the ground and our government told us that was all members of the United States Armed Forces doing that. And I was going to talk about how Mayor Emanuel and Police Superintendent McCarthy told us that the FBI, CIA, ATF, DEA, and Internal Revenue was going to come here to assist the Chicago Police Department, which means they were going to take it over. Uh. An FBI agent soon, if, not, if it's not already happened, an FBI agent will soon walk in to police headquarters and say, I am in charge, I am running the Chicago Police Department, that's going to be that. I was also going to mention that last Saturday was the 77th anniversary of the enactment of the Nuremberg Laws in Germany, and that is significant, although I won't go into it because it's an awful long story. And I was going to say, I have to nitpick with my own self, because I have said many times that we have no more rights in this country. We no longer have rights in this country. The nitpicking part is that's not true. We have rights, it's just that our government does not acknowledge that we have rights, our government violates our rights. 
If you're sitting in a cell like Drew Peterson, it's no consolation to know that you have rights and your government is violating them. The fact is you're still sitting in the cell and you're being violated. But anyway, I decided not to talk about any of that stuff until Tim started running his mouth about capitalism and then Bob Matters started running his mouth about capitalism. <laughs> I've got to remark on that. Tim, you're full of BS and Bob Matters, you're full of BS. You don't know anything about capitalism because you've never lived anywhere where there's capitalism. The United States of America is a welfare country. It's based on bribery and armed robbery. And when I say welfare, I'm not talking about women that live in high-rise buildings with three or four kids. General Motors got a welfare check for $175 billion. If there was capitalism, there wouldn't be any more world, uh, General Motors. Chrysler got a welfare check for billions. AIG got a welfare check for $175 billion. The 10 biggest banks in this country are on welfare. If it was capitalism, J.P. Morgan would be gone, Chase Manhattan would be gone. Yep. The yep. Northern Trust Company in this city, which is supposedly one of the best banks, most sound bank in this country, they took the welfare check from the government in 2008. Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Bank of America, they're all on welfare. If there was capitalism, there wouldn't be any of those banks, General Motors. Chrysler's on his second bailout. Remember Lee Iacocca? He was going to save Chrysler, save the world. He saved it on government money is what he said. And he paid it all back. That may or may not be true. The fact is, if it wasn't given to him in the first place, there wouldn't have been no Chrysler anymore. The government made money on the Chrysler deal. They were venture capitalists. It doesn't Chrysler matter. Saved. If we were a capitalist country, none of that would have happened. Right. Chrysler would have been long ass gone, and it would have been over. They're now making better cars. They did had a good deal. They made money on the auto bail. One fool at a time. Shut up, asshole. <laughs> the Tribune Empire is based on armed robbery. Sam Zell decided he didn't want to pay his bills anymore. He owes two or three billion dollars. He decided he was broke, so he didn't want to pay the bills. So he sent some lawyers to a judge in Delaware, said we're bankrupt. The judge wrote out a piece of paper, said Tribune Company does not have to pay the creditors. And sent government gunslingers to the creditors to serve them with the paper, saying Tribune Company does not have to pay the bills. Tribune Company's been in bankruptcy for four years, and they're making so much money every once in a while, Sam Gell, Sam go, goes to court, sends the lawyers to court, says, Judge, we're making so much money. I want to give bonuses to all the wonderful employees of Tribune Company. And the judge says, okay. They're making all that money. They still don't have to pay the creditors. Okay. So I'm about done. But this is not a capitalist country. This is a welfare company. As long as you pay bribes to the politicians, they'll write you checks, welfare checks, for billions. And if you piss that away, they'll write you more welfare checks for more billions. This is not a capitalist country. I love this group. Uh, <laughs> there's no fear to say anything. And, uh, uh, don't, don't feel being embarrassed or something. So, uh, any sounds can be speaked out here. Uh, I just had a couple of crazy thoughts uh, after the talk. Uh, why is uh, the, the... I just thought about uh, the... And Monsanto seeds cannot pr reproduce uh, the next uh, generation seeds. So some technology is there, and uh, but I, I forgot to ask whether this technology will affect uh, people or animals eating that food. Uh, so that may be a potentially slow down the population growth or something effect on that. Anybody? Heard anything from that? Yeah, actually, I just saw some research out by being published by Russia saying that it shows pictures of the uh, rats' testicles and is showing that they um, it is affecting the reproduction cycles. 
of the rats who are eating it, as well as um, the growth of the baby. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear more evidence uh, on those and also more about the technology side because we know uh, they change the species by just hybrid, hybrid as more natural and sometimes by radiation to stimulate the, the uh, genetic uh, 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 changes or some other technology or even today's uh, genetic modification you, you put needles uh, to to take DNA from here and uh, plant it there uh, yeah I, I like to know more technology how different technology may have uh, some uh, effect like one thing I still don't know uh, like uh, watermelon uh, we got lots of uh, seedless watermelon and uh, I have never heard about that when I was very young, but then gradually it becomes uh, available. And uh, I don't know how those uh, watermelon will grow. And uh, yeah. so I don't know if we, we probably ate lots of uh, seedless watermelon, and uh, I don't know what the effect on my body and my son eats only seedless uh, watermelon. He refused to eat uh, any seeded. <laughs> so those are on technology side. And also, if we put some imagination in the future, uh, I only heard today about uh, genetically modified uh, uh, grains or corns or vegetables or is there genetic modified uh, animals, uh, pigs or cows or something, maybe in the future? Or even more, someday maybe human can have a gen genetically modified uh, human species. And, uh, so next generation will be smarter. I'll take that as you can, sweetheart. Beautiful or whatever, okay. live longer or less. Uh, that's just the, the genet, uh, my imagination. <coughs> Thank you. Because science, Thank you, my science, darling. scientists always try to create something new. It's not. It's difficult to stop that. Uh, the only thing we want to stop is uh, the the big corporations try to benefit on something uh, in proper way, and uh, I think uh, that's. That's what we want to pay attention to. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's get your plate, please. Yes, that's good. All right. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. There's so many facets to this topic here. My interest in agriculture, as I told you, started when I was right out of college. I ended up in a rural area. As a matter of fact, the dairy farm. And I've maintained something of an interest in agriculture ever since. Not that I'm a, a gentleman farmer by any sense, but as a matter of fact, one of the first speakers I scheduled at the College of Complex was when I took on this little job was someone from the Moo organization, the Milk Outrage organization, about this thing called BGH. Now, what I learned tonight, and what we learned at the session many years ago, was that apparently you cannot distinguish milk from normal dairy cows and cows which have been given BGH. Now, certainly cows that are given BGH, <clears throat> there can be harmful side effects. However, the milk is identical. And the problem they ran into was you can't put a label on your product that would indicate that it has some feature that even means like your competitor's milk is no good and things like that. It actually was a false advertising is how the case was decided. And that's why they have that little right. kicker in there. And that, that's really, I don't even think that's right. Either you have two types of milk or you don't have a label. Because I think, in essence, we all want truth in advertising and certainly want food labeling. 
and it was an established. And that was just an interesting case. Um, until such time as you can truly establish that there is a harmful effect. Now that leads me into the next topic. Now tonight, uh, I heard there's not one study that indicates whatever genetically modified food means is harmful for us. Not one bit of evidence can you produce that establishes it. Then why do we know it's dangerous? Is it a feeling, this is a term I use all the time in the cases I have, is it a feeling you have in your heart? You have no evidence. You have nothing. You have, and then again, I say, well, if I eat this genetically modified food, will I get sick? Now, you told me at least, at least, I've got to be concerned about my testicles. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a genuine thing. That, that's the first solid thing I've heard. <laughs> that might make some concern on my part. <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. But I'm serious. Now, if you have no illness, then what is the, why should I exercise fear, or should I exercise a lot of fear, or what quantity you will produce an illness, more like Bob's eating these apples all the, every day, or is it an enormous quantity? Now, it doesn't mean that uh, there aren't dangers in food. Our, our speaker actually hit on it. She did identify possibly the most dangerous food genetically modified or not, it's certainly as strawberries. We had a speaker on that, as a matter of fact, an entire evening. So she was right on the money in that regard. And then, I, this other thing that, I don't know, I've been bouncing around the academic community for a number of years, and I don't know exactly how they were, they were able to, to get to the entire academic world of all these schools of agriculture, and there's a lot of them, let me tell you land-grant colleges, that somehow they got to all the researchers uh, and all the government agencies at the federal, state, and local over this, ag agents and every, everybody, this is a conspiracy of magnificent scale. I mean, this is, this is one heck of a conspiracy. This involves the numbers, numbers of people. Now, are we in fact going into a new world? Yes. Is it certainly what you consume important, without a doubt. Uh, has any of this been established as dangerous or not? It, the, up to this point, the burden of proof lies with the, the anti-GMO people. And you've got a little more work to do ahead of you. It, I haven't heard anything here and other than this great, well, it was a conspiracy. Now, are there in fact practices regarding GMO that are harmful in agriculture, yes. There's no till and the this, this stomping of seed, it's a highly, oh, ready? All right, I'll wrap it up. There's a lot of bad things in agriculture that goes on. Is Monsanto a bad corporation? Unquestionably. Uh, are they out to monopolize the seed industry? Yes, they've got their eyes on the prize. Um, they're looking to, to capture everything. Uh, the other side of the coin is there is a serious food problem in the world. And this is new technology that does have promise of solving that problem. Now the United Nations Agenda 21 is to give every child on earth, and I mean this, there's, a, there's thousands, tens of thousands of children that die every day for lack of nutrition in the world. 40 to 50,000 a day, and their idea was just to get a cup of food like this, uh, to, at least once a day to every child on the earth. That's the goal that they're aiming towards. And is it achievable through this GMO? Let's hope it can. Um, the other thing is there's climate change coming about. Is, is this genetic engineering is a thing? It certainly is a lot better than the old-fashioned ways of collecting seed corns and doing it every year and things like that. That was wonderful in 1900, but this is 2012. Thanks and to your corporate practices. And if we can accelerate practices. the process, you know, uh, I'd say let's go about it. Are there probably going to be some negative effects? Unquestionably. 
there's money to be made, and somebody isn't going to care less whether you and I die. Let's face it, you know, that's capitalism. Okay, okay Charlie, that's time's up. All right, then who are you? Put your charge to the college, like that guy told you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm worried about my testicles, you know. <laughs> 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 I like Corey. Uh, <laughs> 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 Why do suddenly get First of all, with regard to the comments that were made by the Hoosier in the room, um, he seems to want us to return to a world in which Charlie, one fool at a time, please. <laughs> he seems to want us to return to a world in which you get to disagree with your critics by accusing them of Marxism or communism or whatever. Uh, I'm sorry. Just because somebody has the affrontery to criticize a company like Monsanto does not make them a Marxist. <laughs> and if anything, where fraud is concerned, and I'm, and I'm satisfied that Monsanto is perpetuating that on a gargantuan scale, I'm sorry, it's not Marxism to point it out. Uh, if you want to eat, eat those apples, you can go right ahead. In, in that case, I would say an apple a day probably brings on the doctor. Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. And apparently, uh, also, he wants to return to a world in which DuPont can get away with promoting things like better things through better living through chemistry. Instead, we should pay more attention to people like his cousin, Dwight Eisenhower, who, at the, who at, during his farewell address on his last day in office in 1961, warned us of the, of the growing dangers of a military-industrial complex, which now would seem to embrace the agriculture industry as well. Um, A reference was made also to the fact that uh, corn, uh, in its primitive state, was basically a plant with a few kernels on it. That was wild corn. You can't really, you can't find that anymore. Period. It's pretty much been wiped out. It's been hybridized. Had other things done to it, and it's not the simple grass that it once was. Uh, with regard to how was it that Monsanto was able to? Uh, corrupt the agricultural departments at all the various universities by spreading money around. This isn't news. This has been going on since the Robert Barron era, the turn of the last century, where at one university they had a great debate of whether they should take a grant from a prominent Robert Barron, and somebody shouted that it was tainted money, and one of the other professors stood up and said, bring on your tainted money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with regard to Drew Peterson, Peterson is in jail for one reason. A jury said that he was guilty of murder. And as far as I'm concerned, that's it, period, end of story. I, he, I'm sure I have no doubt that the case will be appealed, but for right now, a jury has said that he's guilty, plain and simple. And I agree with the jury's verdict. Finally, for those folks, finally for those folks who are wondering whether science sometimes, how shall I say this, whether it takes them down, the, I'm not a, a, an opponent of science or a believer in the attack on science. But sometimes it takes them down areas that perhaps they might want to think twice about. If you want a fictional example, I'll give you one. When I was a boy over 50 years ago, I, Shirley Temple, who by that point was a 30-year-old woman, was the host of a television series that ran, I believe, on NBC called Shirley Temple Storybook Theater. And it presented stories for children, one, most of which were adopted from fairy tales or other things of that, of that nature. And one of the stories that they presented was a story called The Terrible Clock Man, 
which basically told the story of a medieval clock, well, not a medieval, a Renaissance clockmaker, who in Amsterdam demonstrated to his friends a new robot he had built with a clockwork mechanism and the, of the face of a clock. And he said, see, I'll start his mechanical heart beating. Well, the inevitable happened. He couldn't control it. The robot went out and terrorized the town, and eventually they had to destroy it. So I commend that thought to your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay. I think we're going to have to re get, get some different ideas of both government and market before we can come to grips with this problem. Our speaker said uh, government didn't have anything to do with it. We hear all this stuff about revolving doors and massive fraud. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm surprised a few people around here, but fraud is actually contrary to the free market. Somebody got the Rubik's Cube? No, you know, I can't go into all the ins and outs of that. But I think just to be a little bit of a back collecting. Now, as far as regulation is concerned, there's a book that came out about 50 years ago called The Triumph of Conservatism by Gabriel Falco, who says that the progressive era bureaucracies that were put in, uh, instituted about 100 years ago were not because of outraged populace, but because of the very interests that they were brought about by the very interests they were supposedly to regulate. And the FDA was supposed to control uh, make it safer. Uh, large food processors and you know put out wipe out the small businesses that would uh, <coughs> wipe out the small businesses that would compete with them. I mean this is where I got the idea of the capitalist union. You wipe out your competition, you create a cartel. You use the regulation in the name of something else in a kind of a false flag operation. To do that, I suppose we can stand here and go through a number of false flag operations that actually do things that they're not intended to do, or they're supposedly intended to do. But anyway, uh, I'm not looking for some great big. I think I think what, what, what you have to understand about the market, it's not just the domination of the of the corporation as vast as they may be, but every corporation requires the cooperation of customers, workers and suppliers and so on, but customers in particular. And I think we should we should. Be, it might be rough to try to find some other source of seed than uh, the genetically modified seeds, but uh, it seems for what I hear tonight anyway, sounds like a worthwhile effort. There's been a lot of uh, efforts to uh, create seed banks, uh, store, uh, I guess it's seed. Well, what I've heard is that in case there's a war or something, that there's going to be seeds around that can be replanted and uh, get back into business again. But uh, I don't know how much 
you do to withdraw cooperation. <coughs> if your drinking water has been poisoned and everything else, but the emotion to really think about these things before it gets too far. Okay, wrap it up, Phil. Hi everyone, I promise I won't take up too much of your time here, I'm not much of a public speaker, but I just wanted to share a few things that I found recently. Um, there are studies that have been published and that are now coming out. One of them is by Cryogen, it's C-R-I-I-G-E-N. It's a French company and they've been able to study the full life cycle of rats that have been fed GMO corn and they're finding cancer very widespread in these rats, tumors that are huge, very abnormal, and you should just check it out. There's um, some YouTube videos out there that are well documented, they're well researched, they're scientists, uh, and just at least watch them and make your opinion from there, or form your opinion from there. Another one um, is what I was talking about having to do with testicles. Uh, the laboratory test by the Russian National Academy of Sciences reported that more than half the babies from mother rats fed GMO, fed GM, or genetically modified soy, died within three weeks. The babies in the genetic modified group were also smaller and could not reproduce. Rats fed a commercial rat chow using GM or genetically modified soy within two months had infant mortality facility-wide reaching 55%. I think that's pretty significant. And these, I mean, they're using the rats to do studies that are approving these genetically modified foods for us. It's very, and they've only done, they've only used the rats within a certain time frame, I think uh, within a three month time frame, and they don't actually start seeing the results until four months. So it's very interesting that uh, there's independent groups that are not funded by uh, the large corporate pushers that are coming up with some very interesting research, and I just suggest you look into it. Thank you. Four Brown speaks, we're going to have our, our this young, young lady over here represent, since she is part of the issue, she'll represent our speaker's last word since our speaker had to leave early. Uh, uh, I heard it takes a little work to do it. Anyway, poor politicians. They really get lamb bases. And uh, the, the fault is not just with the politicians and uh, the capitalist politicians live in a society. They have to, uh, to, to be a politician, you have to get votes. To get votes, you have to be noticed. You have to have supporters. You have to have organization, and it all costs money. It costs money in advertising. It costs money to see people, to get on the, the uh, stage uh, when uh, there are groups of people assembled, uh, to be known and to, to be on the ballot takes time and money. It's a lot of work uh, to stay on, if you get elected, to get reelected, uh, gets, uh, it takes time and money. Uh, and, uh, 
and so is a big temptation uh, for uh, an honest politician, and there are many. I mean, if you're going to accomplish anything in a, a legislature or uh, in a, other elective office, you have to you have to continue in that office, uh, not be voted out uh, for uh, insufficient. Uh, reason or cause. Uh, pray for them. What? The honest politician. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look what does that have to do with pray? Pray? Look to see. I gotta pray. Pray. pray on you. If you can't pray, you can't. Uh, it takes thinking. It takes putting yourself in the place of somebody else. They said P R E Y or P R A Y. P R A Y. P R A Y. Should I pray for a bomb or a rock? One fool at a time. Yes, one fool at a time. Pray for the fire. Without any further ado, I give you our final speaker representative. Representative. All right. Jessica. Jessica Fuyan, again. My name is Jessica Fuyan. Thanks again for letting me come here. And um, while Leanne was kind enough to invite me to talk about GMOs, because I have the microphone in my hand, I'm going to use my my last few minutes to talk about the campaign a little bit. Because if you care about GM uh, GMO food, then I suppose you don't want to be eating it, and that's a really important thing. Um, and so I want to say that from the stands of Food and Water Watch, we see that GM food is untested and um, un potentially unsafe for human consumption. I want to refer back to what you were saying about the test that was recently released with rats with tumors a third of their body size. If that's the kind of thing that's happening to rats who were fed GMO corn for two years, imagine what's happening to children who have lived their entire lives where about 85% of foods that are processed and on the shelves at the grocery store contain some GE product. That's horrifying. So um, from the stands of Food and Water Watch, what we're trying to come out with now is that we're not trying to say that like GMO foods are causing autism because we don't know that. There aren't a lot of good studies about the effects of GM foods on humans because it was introduced into the food system and into our grocery stores in a way that was unlabeled. And we can't test something we don't know we're eating. We can't um, find a lot of test subjects who have never eaten GE food, right? It's hard to, it's hard to say. And so our perspective is um, you've got to let us decide. If we're living in, in, a, in a democracy, like some people were saying, if we're living in a uh, society that thrives on intelligence and consumer knowledgeability, then we need to have um, the ability to distinguish between GE foods or GMO foods and regular foods. Um, and so at Food and Water Watch, what we're trying to say is, you know, we, we don't think we have the money, for instance. Um, I think a lot of talk uh, people talked about the fact that these biotech companies have more money than, <laughs> than some small governments. <laughs> um, we don't have the money to take them on and take them down personally, but what we do have is the right to know what we're putting in our bodies. And so do you, you guys have this right as well. But before, um, before now, people haven't made a big stand about it. People have not stood up um, in concert to demand the right to know. Um, so the, the name of our campaign is Let Me Decide. I hope that you all want to decide um, between foods that are genetically modified and that are natural at the store. Um, and we hope that this campaign, um, this campaign for everyone in this room is a no-brainer. Am I right? People want to know what's in their food. And their elected representatives are also people who eat <laughs> and know the difference between genetically modified and not. Um, and so this campaign is a no-brainer, but it will take the support of people over the money that Monsanto can potentially throw at our candidates. So um, until very recently, we weren't really talking about this campaign publicly. So be careful what you do with this video, <laughs> right? Because um, part of the reason, I'm going to be honest, so you really be careful. So I hope that you guys uh, are inspired about this issue after hearing so many of your friends and colleagues talk um, and have a ton of information and that you will contact your older person. I know that I have contacted mine on a number of occasions, and <laughs> we're great friends.
give us give us your website and the place where we can get more information. Great. So, um, uh, the food and uh, food and water watch has a research team in Washington, D.C. who does triple fact checking. Everything is um, pure gold. It's all cited in the back of our fact sheet. So you can find a one-page fact sheet with a one-page citation guide. So you can trace back our research all the way to the beginning. Um, the website is available if you'd like my card is foodandwaterwatch.org. Foodandwaterwatch.org. And again, my name is Jessica Fuyan, so I'm in the Chicago, I am a Midwest organizer. I organize in Chicago and Minnesota. So um, I would love to talk to more people in the future about this issue. If you are looking for vaccine information, please visit our website. Again, thank you for having me. And thank you, Leanne, <laughs> <laughs> for letting me know about this awesome event. Thank you all for coming, and this concludes uh, this session of the Causing Complex.